And I think that's what is magic. And that's why I enjoy playing and also making games. Hello, I'm Ali and welcome to Crafted Reality, a podcast by Yellow Brick. In this podcast, we are going to be exploring what it means to make creative work in the margins, work that doesn't quite fit into a neat little box. This podcast will include conversations with some of the leading makers in the world of LARPing, street games and general multimodal experiences. And we, Yellow Brick, will be sharing some of our work as we develop a number of projects this year. In time, we hope we can build a community of creatives that are interested in making work that explores the boundaries of situationism and experience. In this first episode, myself and co-founder Julian Sykes will talk about our humble beginnings, the background of Yellow Brick, and also the people and projects that inspired us to make work in this space. Okay, so we were just talking off air about what why we were doing what why we we're going to do what we're going to do um and i guess we started making things 2009 2009 2000, yeah. 2010 that kind of time um this episode i should have said is going to be called humble beginnings um and i think we had a com- we just had this conversation just now about why we should do a podcast above other people And I don't think that's really the question, but I guess what we did come to the conclusion was, is that in 2009, 2010, 2011, we kind of went to a lot of things that would be classified as anything from immersive theater through to pervasive street games to alternate reality games. We can put all of those kind of glossary of terms in in the notes. Um, And none of those organizations or none of those games kind of exist anymore. And I guess there's a lot of stuff that maybe you could dig out over the internet, but maybe those things have literally just gone. So we figured that we'd do some background about that kind of stuff, a bit of background about how we started making some games, stroke theater, stroke experiences. And then later on, in the f- next few episodes, maybe talk about one of the projects we're working on, um, I guess for the next year or so, maybe even the next two years. That sounds good. And we've stopped. And we've, <laughs> we need to get used to saying yes and no instead of nodding our heads. Yeah, sorry, I was nodding all the way through that so nobody could actually see. Um. So yeah, maybe do you want to say how we started or? Yeah, so I guess we had met, as Julian said, in 2009 at a event that Julian and some friends had put on called ARC. And it was essentially an open invitation for anybody in Cardiff to come along and give their opinion on what they wanted to change within the city. And I went along to that event. In the middle of the room was this massive pink cow where we were invited to basically splatter on said pink cow, lots of post-it notes with um, thoughts and thinking around what we wanted to change and how basically essentially bring people together within the community. And I think it was from that workshop then, anybody that wanted to be involved and pursue some of the themes that had emerged were invited to come along to a kind of Wednesday club, which happened in a pub after work, to look at how these things could actually be made real in the world. And I think some of the themes from that workshop were... um, I think there was public and private space. Yeah, public there, and private space, yeah. There was a load of building work, wasn't there? Being, that was Like there was a new shopping centre that was basically just kind of demolishing the centre of Cardiff City Centre and then there was a new bit being built on top. And I think it was at that point there was lots of empty, empty shops and in Cardiff there's lots of um, Victorian arcades and they suddenly, over that period of time, like two or three years, 
were just really empty. And I think one of the ideas was to look at how to reclaim those spaces with the question of, you know, what can an, a shop be? Does it always have to be for retail? Uh, can it be something else? And then I think there was also something around uh, transport and transport links, particularly looking at cycling and how you could get around the city. Because again, the infrastructure that we sort of have now uh, in Cardiff in terms of the cycling network wasn't there before. So it was looking at how you can encourage people to basically get out of their cars and either walk or cycle places. Yeah, and then I think we did, and then I guess that, I think there was about six to 12 themes. I mm. think we got it down to six. Yeah, six. And then, as you said then, we then kind of said, what projects can we make that maybe in some way respond to these themes or these issues? Um, and then, like you say, the first one was an empty shop project Yeah. Um, in one of the arcades. We managed to do a load of different things like a cinema film night. Um, we did workshops for local businesses to see how they could kind of come together and, and improve that general area or their offer. Um, loads of different things. We had an interactive window with uh, actors kind of acting out different kind of uh, scenes and things like that. And then I'm pretty sure it was that winter we did a mini play arc which was a we then decided to look at we kind of were summing up what would kind of work in challenging what public and private spaces were what would work in yeah in urban environments and i think i don't know if this was just additional we were also kind of really interested in how I think we said this all the time but like as a child you're encouraged to play and I think at that point it was um, talking about play as a aid to learning and then when you become an adult like play is seen as not particularly productive um, so we were kind of interested in that idea of like what does adult play look like how can you challenge public and private spaces? And I did have no recollection of how we came across what is known as perva uh, pervasive street games. But we did. Do you have it? Do you remember like how, like what we saw? Was it literally Bristol, or do you think? Yeah, it was I think we had got from that initial workshop also the idea of I guess how you bring people together. Mm as well as the themes that you just mentioned, um, how you could perhaps break down some of the barriers between strangers or between people um, on like a really basic level. And I think we did start looking at um, areas that were investigating or experimenting with play and I think then that's how we found kind of came into games and things like yeah that. how we found games and there was um quite a massive scene in Bristol where pervasive street game was was a, a really big thing yeah and I and for context as well it's kind of interesting that Bristol's watershed literally launched the pervasive studio, pervasive media studio, exactly the same time as Think Arc. That was the same time. And within that studio um, was a company called Slingshot, run by two Simons. And I think before that it was called Simon Games, which is always, always quite funny. Um, and they were making street games because there was, I guess they'd been inspired by games in New York because there's a, an original OG games festival uh, in New York that's kind of always been challenging these things. Um, and they'd have like, in New York, there'd be like a streetwide Pac-Man game where there'd be like people in ghosts and people as Pac-Man kind of going through the street. And it was almost like layering Pac-Man into the gridded thing of Manhattan. 
So I think may, we went to, I think we went to their workshop called Ig, Ig Lab. Um, and there was me, you, three or four others. And weirdly that day, I'm pretty sure that's where the concept for 2.8 hours kind of came that day and 2.8 out there's so much kind of we're going to have to like caveat and asterisk for this but 2.8 hours later became a nationwide um zombie chase game that dropped into loads of different cities for probably about one or two two years i think it might have run a bit longer than that yeah, yeah. and there were like hundreds of people every night being chased by actors acting as zombies and you either got infected or you survived, that kind of thing. You had to just go from A to B to C to D, et cetera. Um, and there was a conversation about that day. It was kind of enlightening in the sense of genre, mechanic, location. And that kind of fits into the stuff that you'd previously done, I guess, as an actor. But like in devising terms about site-specific and how maybe location kind of becomes a character in a way. Yeah, I mean, I guess location is a really kind of key storytelling mechanism, isn't it? Whether you're building a set or whether you are particularly placing a story within a very specific location for whatever reason. And that could be scenic, that could even be memory, history, past... You know, it could, it's it's all of those things, isn't it? So, yeah. and I suppose with pervasive street games, which essentially are games played in urban environments to varying degrees of complexity or story or not story led, it's very much about having an experience that is layered onto the city. And, and you're using the... I guess, attributes of those locations rather than, I mean, you can obviously set dress, but you're kind of trying to choose those locations because what they are rather than trying to like white box them and then turn them into theatre sets. Like you're choosing them specifically because they have a value, right? Yeah, I mean, you'd have to have... So much money. Thousands of pounds yeah. <laughs> to try and like recreate, you know, the a cityscape, isn't it? So yeah. I think using that space in a way that does say something about a story or does uh, give you a feeling when you're playing a game, even if that's a feeling of um, um, excitement or... Yeah, like you go you go do- deep down into a basement and, you know, it's, it's murky, it's scary. Then you use that attribute to mm. then put something scary down there, mm. right? Or you play with it and go the other way and you can yeah. put something really fun down there and it's... And then the farcical, well, not necessarily farcical, but the ridiculous nature of you going down to play Duck Hunt or something like that on a Nintendo in the dark is kind of like quite amusing. Mm. Um, So, yeah, we did a workshop with IGLAB. And I guess they were doing that because they also run a festival every year where people would come and host like mini pervasive street games and these could be literally kind of like two or three minute games through to one or two hour roaming games through the city um and for those of you on youtube we can put some of those kind of photos and stuff to kind of explain that in in the video um so we kind of did that I get a bit murky as to what the order was, but then we went to, we did go to London's Games Festival at the time, which was Hide and Seek. Yeah. Um, And around about that time as well, there was a massive kind of game called Conspiracy for Good, which was, I think it was a three weekend is it a trilogy kind of weekend, set weekends? I think it was over four weekends. So four weekends. And okay. it sort of had a, a story that spanned... Those four weekends. Those four weekends right. in a month. But you didn't necessarily have to go to all four. No. You could kind of drop in or drop out. Um, we, and we only found out about it kind of quite late, yeah. didn't we? we? I think we only ha- ever had the opportunity to go to the last two if we could have done. Mm, yeah. 
So it was a game created um, by Nokia and, and Tim, Tim Kring. Tim Kring from Heroes. Who had fame, fame, yeah. Heroes fame, yeah. Um, the TV show uh, Saved the Cheerleader TV series. Um, and we went to the last one. Yeah, I think we did, yeah. And learned a lot about a lot of things in that one. And I think some of it good, quite a lot of it bad in terms of things that we wouldn't want to make ourselves. Like, everyone got a Nokia phone at the end of it. You've Weird. still got your I've success still got in a box. In a box. <laughs> um, we spoke, um, there was a group of people that were properly gaming the game. So they brought a whole punch. So the, the whole premise of that was to go, basically get a job, wasn't it? Yeah, I think basically you you turned up and you were kind of instructed to come dressed for a job interview. And you were, I guess, the underlying mission then, let's say, was to infiltrate this company, which was, you know, had very... Um, uh, not very good intentions, let's say, um, towards, um, I guess, was it, it was, uh, I can't remember, was it like deforestation? It wasn't that, where was yeah, it? It was. I can't remember. There was they a, were doing something kind of quite corrupt, basically. They were yeah. a corrupt or organisation that um, you had to bring down from the inside. So with you, you as individual players or um, as team members, that was the ultimate goal. Everybody was working the ultimate goal to basically get a, get a job and then have access to the building. So some of it took place outside and then other parts of it took place within a building. But as you went through, you were given a phone, weren't you, to uh, find different parts or different locations that gave you information to be able to essentially gain access a to an interview and then eventually gain access to the building itself where you have to I think recover some kind of um, database yeah and I think um, the technology in the phone was like pretty impressive back then it probably doesn't sound it now but it it was a Nokia phone that had a camera and somehow I still don't quite know how it did it it would recognize the the actual space you were in and then give you content based on it. I guess a bit like a QR code, but it was take the QR code was the actual location. So it wasn't GPS. It was actually like, it'd be like a post box next to a, a ch uh, like a bench. And it would then ping up the location from there. And I guess we learned a lot from that because some people have got really into it. I mean, I guess they'd been in it for four weekends and they, t they brought a hole punch with them and they'd punch their card, which was an indication of how good they were going through the interview process. I think we were on level one, weren't we? Or level two. <laughs> take very far. And they had like about 49 punches or something. They were like, I think they got the job, but then they managed to infiltrate. And I guess we did a few bit other bits, like we, we did a, a museum tour thing called Ghostwriter with Last Theory, um, we did just we basically just did a load of R and D and just went to see and experience as much as we could. And I think we the way we then brought that back to Cardiff was we did we basically put on a, a few mini games ourselves. There's a website, I think it's still running called ludocity.org, I think it is, um, where we kind of took some of their games that were kind of uh, that are collected street games that people publish and, you know, share. We stuck some of them on and got the people that were part of Think Arc um, to come and try, played some of that. Um, and then eventually we put on a, a larger little mini festival for Cardiff and then eventually started doing slightly bigger games. Um, and I guess the thing, as Ali was saying earlier, the thing that we were really interested in was this it became the for the bigger games you're always chucked into teams pretty much it's never a singular thing because you just can't you wouldn't be able to manage that so generally it's about six people and quite quite often six is quite awkward as a number in terms of people don't know six six friends 
So you'll end up getting like couples or a four and a two or three and a three. And the way that games level the playing field between the the players was just incredible. Like people never knew each other. And then within 15 minutes, we we're like working together as a team to try and kind of get through this experience it was kind of really interesting. And then I think the other thing that, became apparent when we'd been doing all these games is the idea of, I guess, the player and the audience. Um, and I guess you were particularly interested in that aspect coming from specifically more of a theatre background. Yeah, so I think when we played games, we had found that camaraderie quite surprising, really that we could turn up to an event and then have this quite in-depth experience with total strangers who you'd never see again. But within that hour or two hours of gameplay, you just had the most amazing time with with people that, you know, you didn't know very much about. But, you know, it's, it's kind of really quite magic. And I think that was part of why we wanted to create our own variation of playing game within Cardiff because I don't think you well from my point of view you don't get that when you go to a theatre you don't necessarily have that type of relationship with an audience member sitting next to you and often unless you kind of have the seat allocated you always leave that seat you know, um, between you and and the other person, you know, and I don't know why we do that. You know, we have barriers, we have boundaries as human beings. I'm not sure if that's kind of a very, you know, British behaviour, but that's kind of what happens. So I think the relationship that I think games just somehow magically create is very different from that audience behavior of sitting in a dark room and watching something yes for sure you are consuming the same content and being um let's say witness to the same experience for sure however i think games just take that you know to a totally different level where you are very much sharing that experience um on on a much deeper level yeah. Um, and having that um, relationship where you are actually talking to someone as you are playing the game, you are having a conversation, you are communicating, it is active rather than passive. And I think that's what's, um, you know, so incredible about games. And what we have found over the years of making uh, games of very different sizes, you know, really small to to really big, really intimate to you know, spectacle is that you'll see people turn up with uh, barriers and you can kind of see it in their body language and their faces. And you can kind of almost see them judging, oh, I'm not sure this isn't for me. And guaranteed within half an hour, you see them and they have transformed like their body language, their facial expressions, their, their whole persona has changed because play has has this amazing transformative effect on people and I think that's what is magic and that's why I enjoy playing and also making games because it's just so special um and I think it's I guess it's important to say that uh, when we're talking about pervasive street games generally um so as we said, there's like six people maybe in a in a team. Quite often for the bigger games, you're then going to a location and at that location there's quite often an actor who's kind of going to be delivering some part of the, I guess, plot itself, but also maybe some mechanical kind of game or something like that. And then you go on to location and location. And so you've got this kind of really interesting thing of, as you say, like trust between the groups. And then because you're placing it into a city center, you've, and there's lots, generally lots of these teams going from da, 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 you know, you've then got lots of people looking at you that aren't playing the game that are then looking in. And that audience is kind of really interesting to kind of see them as an audience looking on this performance, this larger performance. And then I guess 
the thing that was always interesting for me specifically was the fact that on top of what Ali was saying is that we're not necessarily asking people to be a character. They're themselves playing the game in that situation. So we're not talking about LARPing where, you know, you're potentially creating a, a, a side character that you become for a weekend. This is a moment where you can play as yourself. You can make decisions as yourself. And we kind of came across this thinking about the idea of we're just placing people in situations and then allowing them to be themselves within those situations. And I think there's obviously levels and you want to give those people as many opportunities to be themselves, but also be more. Like so they would so if that door hints that there's something behind it, make sure that there is something behind the door and those kind of things. So I guess if they want to delve deeper, they can delve deeper in 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 certain way with a caveat that hopefully it's not dangerous for them and stuff like that. So I think that was kind of important. Yeah, and I think we learned a lot of lessons along the way with I guess how immersive, and I'll use that word, we'll talk about immersive in another episode. <laughs> but Or maybe never. Or maybe never. Okay. But how engaged people can be. And again, I think this is kind of why there's an interesting split with what theatre can, you know, um, give people compared to actually what game rewards people with. Um, so our very, very first um, large-scale street game that we created uh, was a game called Everwake and it was a multi-location uh, physical game that we plotted within um, an area in Cardiff called Canton. So we had uh, 12 locations, some indoors, some outdoors. Some locations had actors, some didn't and people were placed into groups of six. As Julian had said, that's kind of the, the structure that we, we usually stick by. So we'd invited everybody to the first location which you know essentially gives um, your kind of outer world rules and these usually are you know if you run across the road a yeah, you're not a superhero <laughs> the laws of physics do apply that's borrowed from uh, Simon from Slingshot yeah um, if you get hit by a bus you, you will die bus, you will yeah. die so all of these kind of outer world rules and I never actually quite understood them until actually this our, our first creation of, of, of this street game called Everwake um and then the introduction um, in world rules is kind of the plot and the story. And within that game, we'd given a kind of time limit, a limit of about an hour and a half where mm -hmm. people could roam um, kind of freely between different locations on a map that they were provided. And you can kind of go wherever you want to do in whatever order you wanted to. And we had uh, kind of created a really simple setup where we had a projector and a screen and an actor basically um, given this this beginning of the plot, the story in this um, in this hall that we had. And this is where we realized actually this isn't definitely not theater. So the projector was on and the video that was playing was another character that, people had been introduced to via an online story, like a, like some pre-content that we'd created. And when we recorded this content, we had written the script where there's just a cut-off point and he's about to go and say something, but we never actually continued writing the end of the line. I can't remember what the line was, but it was something like, you know, and remember to, and that, and that it cut, and that's where the script cut. Um, and that's where the film cut for dramatic effect. And during that opening scene, because the film cut off, we had one member of the audience kind of get up and try and uh, play the rest of the film. But of course, we hadn't actually recorded any more of that film. Um, so that was kind of quite a surprise for us. And then we uh, had this kind of, kind of seat where we had sort of suggested to the audience that they had been locked in the room. So the door that they'd come through had been locked. Um, but then another member of the audience went, oh, just go out the fire exit. <laughs> so it's just like, so sort of those Within kind of Within the things, space of what, five, five minutes, minutes, the game had been like... Broken a little the, bit. Yeah, the yeah. thoughts of what would have happened. But I don't think we were necessarily expecting that kind of reaction or that sort of level of agency up front. You know, that was within the first, yeah, 10, 15 minutes of the game where actually because it was a game 
that had given people permission to do and behave in certain ways. Nothing wrong with any of those actions, just to say. But we had learned a very important lesson that if you kind of give people that agency and you give them, I guess, uh, rabbit holes to take a peek, peek through, you kind of got to continue or allow those people to follow through with that um, that pathway and that journey, if they so wish. Um, yeah, the worst thing, and I think we it became more apparent for us on in other people's work, I guess, in some respects, that when there were things that weren't, I guess, and I guess this is the difference, They there's often things that were classified as immersive or interactive um, that were kind of from a theatre angle that just stopped, like these hints of things, kind of these extra rabbit holes, as you said, and then, but there was nothing beyond it. Mm. And you could definitely tell the difference between someone who'd had like a game background in making these things, because you could always follow those threads and they would hopefully give you some kind of like extra bit of content or meet you with something like that. Whereas obviously with regards to theatre, there's, there's quite often, okay, I'll go and follow this. And then there was like nothing. I kind of remember going to the, was it Praxis Makes Perfect in NTW show? Yeah, but I think we, at this point, we'd become the worst theatre goers. Yeah. Because we were now looking for those yeah. extra parts of experiences. Yeah. And then we kind of went and followed this guy because he'd kind of given us a business card and it, like it just kind of ended. Well, he had sort of said, you know, follow me. And yeah. I remember they were like, okay, we're going to follow him. Yeah. We followed him around the room. And, and then I think we caught we caught him sort of at the end and he just looked really shocked that, that we'd actually followed him. Followed him. Yeah. Um, and I think we were at uh, another one where we were wondering whether we could get into caravans because the caravan backstage was kind of visible and stuff like that. So we, it, yeah. it did definitely break our... Uh, Expectations, I think. Yeah, and I think it's because, like... I think, And I think that's the other thing. Like, there's this... It becomes a point where you are indirectly or directly creating, co-creating the piece, you know, like, with the makers... And the makers generally in this context are happy with that. Whereas I think they're often within the realms of theatre. It's a bit more like film where, you know, the film is locked in and locked down. And in theatre often, I mean, once again, not in not any all, way yeah. all the time, but often there's this thing where you are literally watching while it's live and it's in front of you. It's still kind of like a, a film that's never going to alter other than maybe, like you said, who you're sat next to on the mm. day. Whereas without the players, there is actually no film or theatre, really, in Pervasive Street Games. Like, it doesn't run. Um, it would literally just be an actor stood in a location waiting for some people. And I think, as Ali was saying before, the first one we made ourselves was Everwake. And it was specifically going, you could go to any location which was slightly different to the things we'd done up to that point, as in not we, the things we'd played up to that point, which were very much A, B, C, D, E, F, G in location. There wasn't really much choice. So we allowed that kind of, a deliberate choice was for us to allow people to go anywhere they wanted with the idea that in effect, they were making their own story. Um, so, and a big part of that then became I think we knew after, we knew because we'd already played some games, but uh, came after that, which was known as the, the froth, mm. right? The the idea of then retelling your story back at the pub at the end of the, the night. Well, I, I, my understanding um, might be totally wrong, but I guess that, that's a LARP in term, isn't it? Yeah. The froth of the story um, that you have very much played quite a key role within. Yeah. That then you are the storyteller of your own destiny within that hour or two hours of play yeah where yeah as you said it's it's the campfire moment of i did rather than i saw so i did being really active uh, within that situation rather than i saw being a very passive um and again that kind of i think um the kind of memory 
like the, the kind of the physical body memory of doing again is really really powerful than the, the kind of passive embodiment of just sort of sitting uh, and watching I think has you know quite significant effects on people uh, and there's lots of moments from games that we've played in Bristol where the memory of that play is so clear mm, yeah. um, and the emotions um, and the embodiment of that, you know, that, that they've kind of, they're really kind of core memories burnt into my brain. Whereas maybe other passive experiences that I've had, you they're, they're kind of not so vivid. And I talk about those two things very, very differently, you know, in a much more kind of animated way about the games that I've physically played to the things that I've perhaps passively been witness to. Yeah, there's, I mean, I think that that's going going back to that kind of summer of research and development and kind of going to experience these things. The first time that you, uh, we kind of coined, we kind of all grouped it, coined it as being given permission to go and play in these spaces that mm-hmm. are borderline public, borderline private. And the first time you're given permission to play in those spaces is thrilling uh, and it's kind of just like kind of alters your kind of viewpoint on things to a level where you kind of start questioning a lot of different things to the point where you know you're in a Wilco's and you're playing a a game on a over a telephone conference call and you've got to kill the king you know in, in a in a made up like scratch game that we'd done during a an egg lab to the moment where there's me, you, Carwin and Laura in a group in Bristol on in the very, very first iteration and 2.8 hours later, having a casual chat with an armband, chatting away as to, I wonder what these zombies look like. I'm not really sure. You know, will it be that obvious? And then suddenly seeing at a distance a, uh, a hospital robed zombie, you know, face dressed, looking at us and we're just and <laughs> I remember that point I think it might have been Carwin he just said under his breath run <laughs> <laughs> and and then us just going you know this whole kind of idea of like oh we'll all be you know absolutely we'll be a team yeah and it's just all <laughs> flying in different directions yeah. but you know that moment again like there's something so filmic about that moment absolutely you, you did feel that like you were just so you were placed within that frame of a film suddenly yeah. you were there yeah um, just kind of quite incredible and again that that idea of I think we talked about earlier the the set uh, of the the environment it is our, our known reality and then as soon as you chuck something uh, different into it you know it, it becomes so much more mm. believable yeah um, or even if you don't believe it you you at least are willing to suspend your disbelief that little bit more um i think yeah um, yeah i think the yeah, i think you're right i think that visceral kind of you can tell it's a real car park that you're running around in right is i think it's the kind of it is the difference between that and something like a punch drunk show where you can still sa- sense that the punch drunk you know there's still walls and I think maybe that's why the previous punch drunk kind of worked well, because it was meant to be a film set within a thing, right? So then those fake walls kind of make sense. Whereas you're in Bristol, that ground is that ground, that car park is that car park, and that therefore means that must be a zombie, right? Mm. And I think, um, yeah, there were two moments in that game, three moments. The first time, as we said, four moments, actually. The very first location we went to, you got chucked out the back. Do you remember that? Mm. And you got chucked out by the bins. And yeah. we'd got out, managed to get out, no, okay, and we'd run the right way. But some group had not run the right way. And so they're trying to vault over this deadly, deadly fence in the first location. How they didn't die, I have no idea. But, you know, <laughs> that was just crazy. Just literally within, what, 15 minutes, just change. Mm-hmm. They are going from flight to fight straight away. And then there was the car park. We played in a car park 
where we got split up, we're on the phones trying to find each other. That was just bonkers. And then the one that really, really, and this is maybe the exception to the rule in a way that was kind of one that really reminds me because, and this is kind of my, maybe why I want to talk about it because of specifically we kind of got into the senses a bit later on with some of our work. Do you remember the toilets where they had the, they'd put the bleach down and we'd gone into this, literally, it was a public toilets, but they'd managed to get, uh, they'd managed to take it, uh, use it, should I say, or get access to it. And you went in there and it was this bleach and you could, your eyes were just like streaming because it was so much of it. And you went through those big plastic industrial kind of curtains, aren't they? Like stripy curtains. And then there were some people cutting dead bodies Bodies. up, like apparently. (laughs) And that, there was something about that which kind of just took it to that next level. And I think it was, I think there was an element of that where you were just like, it was just too, too real. Like in a really good way. Like it was just incredible. You've been listening to Crafted Reality with me, Ali John and Julian Sykes. If you like the podcast, please make sure that you give us a like and press that subscribe button. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>